it is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Mark Reinecke of the Child Mind Institute. We have slides. Thank you. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Um, this was anxiety. I didn't know we were going to have slides this morning. So <coughs> I hope you don't mind. Actually, let me do something, if we could. One is um, thank you to the Nimmo family and to Z Cares for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. And I actually really very much like that, turning to the left and right and saying hello and I'm glad you're here, because I am glad you're here. Um, we're all in this together and trying to make sense of this and trying to be of help to children and teenagers and families. And so thank you very much for coming out and on a Saturday morning uh, to hear us, to, to be part of this. Um, if you would like, actually I would put an invitation, come forward, we got such a small group here today. Um, you know, how would you put it? They canceled South by Southwest, but they did not cancel us. So, you know, I would like this to be something of an informal discussion. Um, think of us as sitting around a table um, in the kitchen and uh, just talking about what's on our mind, all right? So, and let me move this over. And I like that we've got this, so this way I can go, sort of go off script. All right, here we go. So, next slide, please. We're going to talk about anxiety. This is Child Mind Institute. Uh, this, the group I'm with is out of New York. We are an independent, not-for-profit um, clinical research institute that focuses exclusively on uh, child, and adult, child and adolescent mental health and in working with families. We're really modeled after two organizations. On the clinical side, we're modeled after uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And if you've ever been to Mayo, you know how good they are. They are exceptional. Very, very high quality, individualized, personalized care, and it's all evidence-based. If it doesn't have research behind it, they don't do it. And so too with us. We are a pure play, strong clinical program and very much individualized. As you mentioned, uh, well, the second group that we model after is St. Jude's in Memphis. And they are, as you know, not-for-profit, and they focus on um, uh, child cancer. So as they focus on that, we focus on mental illness, on depression, anxiety, learning differences, those sorts of things. From St. Jude's, we get two things, which you alluded to. One is we have a no child turned away policy, and the second is we have a no wait list policy. And that's why we call you, if you call us, we'll call you back the same day, and we'll get you in touch with the doc within 24, now we say 24 hours, that's 95% of the time. Sometimes it takes me an extra day to figure it out and it's 48 hours, but we'll, just for the sake of discussion, say 24 hours, you'll always get a call back and we'll always put you in touch with the doc for an appointment almost immediately. That no, in a world where people have long, long wait lists, the way I put it, it's making my hair gray by the day. Um, but we really do try to be responsive and to give high quality care. So that's us. Next slide. Because we're a clinical research institute, we have the same tripartite mission as you'd find at, how would you put it? We're a child study center without the dean. We ha have clinical practice, the clinical care, research, largely on neuroscience, but we're moving now into more applied areas, such as individual, what they call at Stanford, precision medicine. How do you know which treatment is going to be most effective for each individual child? So we have a strong research program and public education. So we try to, how would you put it? This is the difference between my career here and my career at university, is we try to take things out of the clinic and out of the ivory tower and put them out into the community where they can do some good. I must say, when you're an academic, I've been an academic for 30, 35 years, and you work for a year on a paper and six people read it. It's not good. What we want is to take these things which really do do some good and put them out into the world where people can make, make sense of them and use them. So that's our mission, public education and dissemination. Next slide, please. I have nothing to disclose. How would you put it? I'm not in anybody's pocket, um, which is, I guess, good. <laughs> Next slide, please. Those are our learning objectives for today. We're going to talk about anxiety. And this is about children and adolescents, but it's also, if you think, read between the lines, it's about you and me. If I, we could ask, is anybody in the room, anybody, not anxious or stressed recently? Anybody? Everybody, anybody chill? No, nobody's chill anymore. We were talking about this just before we came in. It's so different now than when we were growing up. Um, when I was growing up, 
you know, I grew up in, on a ranch in Placerville. We were free range kids. You know, our parents would let us loose and it, life was easy and fun. For teenagers and children nowadays, not so much. And if you go back over the decades, go back to 1910, 1920, every decade, I'm sort of drawing on a paper across the board here that's in front of me. Every decade, 10, 20, 1930s, 1940s, there is an almost linear increase in base rates of depression, and I presume in anxiety, in America. This is part of our society. It's nothing new, but it's getting worse, and it's, we can almost feel it. There's things that we're anxious about. Next slide. So we live in a worried world. Next slide. She's anxious. Next one. He's anxious. Keep going. That looks like my office. He's anxious or she's anxious. Next one. We, what do we worry about? We worry about political events. Next one. We worry about the election. This, I, I love this magazine cover. This is last week, American Nightmare. Can it get, can the, can the, how would you put it, political um, enmity get any worse? And the answer is yes. We're just, we are just warming up. Next slide. We worry about terrorism. Next slide. We worry about global warming, which is a real problem. Are there things in our society generally that contribute to anxiety? And one of the things that I do is on the bottom of my slides, I put down little notes in red. How would you put it? Stuff just to think about. Uh, like poverty is associated with anxiety. Minority status, community support, being undocumented, really hard. Um, community and school violence, social media, including cyberbullying. It makes life difficult. And then this is. California, environmental events, and I was thinking about this, if you think about it. Fires, hurricanes, floods, this stuff, droughts now, now what, we've been, what, five weeks without rain until this morning? These things, how would you put it, those fires that were up in uh, Napa and Sonoma County, you know, we like to think that they are one-off events and that we can tell our children and we should all be sec secure that they're not going to happen again, but they will. When corona is gone, we'll have another virus. Something's gonna, there's going to be another fire, and we don't know where. There's going to be a flood or a mudslide, and we don't know where. What we can say is we live in a risky and dangerous world, but it's always been that way. Equanimity comes from knowing, not that I can prevent bad things from happening, but from knowing and having confidence that we can cope with them when they arrive. And that's both, that resilience comes from internal factors, my internal sense of confidence and what they call um, efficacy, my ability to influence my world, but also what you alluded to before. We're all in this as a community, and community supports help with managing the stresses that life brings us, which is why, for example, you know, community support and minority status, it's hard when you don't have a cohesive community around you, and that's where being able to turn to the left and turn to the right and say, you know, I'm really glad you're here. It really does carry, it doesn't carry all the freight, but it's a significant contributor, it's knowing that I'm not in this alone. Other people get it, and other people are there to support me, helps us to get through the trials and tribulations of life, regardless of what that threat is, whether it's a fire or a hurricane or a flood or a virus, or a thin letter from the IRS that says, by the way, you're overdue on your taxes. All of these things are, or if you're a student, a bad grade on an exam, the underlying message is we'll get through it. Let's just step back keep perspective and we'll get through it. Next slide, please. They're anxious. What we're talking about this morning, children and adolescents, they worry a lot. Next slide, please. And uh, the way I would put it, is there any teen who is not stressed? The answer is no. No, this is, I've got it, my daughter, our daughter is now 24 years old, so we've been through this. But what would she say when she was a teenager? Stress, high school, just saying. You know, it's just there. It's part of our life. Next slide, please. So what is anxiety? Let's go back and talk about biology. And I hope you don't mind, but I do talk data. I'm a college professor by, that's who I am. I talk data. I talk research. I talk evolutionary theory. It's just how I think. Um, my daughter, I'll go off script here a little bit. My daughter, when she was little, I said, you know, Gracie, her name's Gracie, said, you know, my favorite movie is um, Apocalypse Now. And she goes, really? And she goes, yeah. Have you all seen Apocalypse Now? 
Yeah, I, lo I told her, I said, Gracie, I love data in the morning. It smells like victory. She goes, Dad, you're so weird. I'm like, yes. So we are going to talk some science today. So what do we know about anxiety? One is it's an, an adaptive and normal uh, state. It's from an evolutionary perspective, very old. There are some slides I cut out of here based on a little worm, a little nematode. It's only a centimeter long, called C. elegans. And C. elegans, they've, how would you put it? They've identified every gene in its genome, and they've identified every nerve in the body. It's only got 300 nerves in its body in this little nematode. And in it, there's these two nerves that come together like this, up at the, a node at the front of the little guy. I love this little guy, because from an evolutionary perspective, all of us, everyone in this room, we are descendants of C. elegans from this little nematode, this little worm. And what does this little worm tell us? This one nerve, when you activate it, the little guy moves forward towards something that's nutritious in the, so in the soil. The other nerve, when you activate it, he puts it in reverse and backs away from something that's noxious in the soil, moving towards reward, moving away from threat. Everything from the limbic system up is based upon that simple presence. How we process, everything is just a, a more sophisticated way of thinking about how do we process reward and move toward it? How do we process threat and get away from it? That's what this little guy tells us. So anxiety is an normal adaptive response to, and the key word is a perceived threat. We're seeing something dangerous, whether it's a drought, a virus, a thin letter from the IRS. Uh, I've been told I need to come to my professor's office. There's, we're perceiving a threat. It may be a threat or it may not be a threat, but we are perceiving it as a threat and responding accordingly. There are three or four sets of, there's physiological reactions. Your heart rate starts to accelerate. Your, there's contractions of muscles because you're getting tense, ready for fight or flight. Pupils dilate. You're getting ready to take in more information. There's physiological react. Cortisol starts to pump up. Adrenaline starts to pump up. We're getting ready to deal with this threat. So your body's going to respond. There are cognitive changes. There's what they call, the, the phrase they use in the literature is control precedence. The way I put it is, anxiety takes control of your body. The way I would phrase it is, it's very hard to think about what you want for dinner when you're about to be hit by a bus. Think about it. I'm from Chicago. If you get off at Clark Street and you step off the curb and all of a sudden you see a CTA bus coming at you, what's the reaction? Whoa! And you jump back. And you, Jesus Christ, that was close. And the bus comes whooshing in front of you. But it's very hard to think about dinner and what movie you were going to see that night and how your kid is doing when a bus whooshes in front of your face. It takes control precedence. Everything gets put to the back. Now, what happens then on these cognitive, we start scanning. We start looking for more buses. Is there another one coming? We become vigilant. We start remembering, where have I seen this in the past? How am I going to cope with this? Maybe I should take a different street. We start to ruminate about it. We go home and go, honey, you know something? I got to tell you, I almost got hit by a CTA bus. The anxiety takes control of the biological system to prevent you from getting, to cope with the threat, to keep you from getting hit by, now you realize this, the bus is a metaphor to get hit, keep from getting hit by the bus of life. Finally, there's behavioral. What we see, if we see, if you're coming out of a, a club at Clark Street at, one in the morning, you've had a nice meal, and you did some dancing, and you come out and you hear steps coming out of a alley behind you, you think, oh my, I'm about to get mugged. And what do you do? You quicken your steps and you shoot to the other side of the street. You try to flee, you try to escape and avoid the threat. That's the natural response. If I can't cope with it, I'm gonna get away from it. Consider for a moment though, if you're coming out and you're not coming out from dinner, but you are a Chicago cop and you see this guy coming out of the alley, what do you do? Well, they've always got that microphone up here, right? This is 4217, I'm at Clark and Addison. Yep, send backup, send two, roll it. And you reach down and you unbuckle your gun, and you walk up to the guy and go, buddy, yeah, you, come here. Let's see what you got in your pockets, right? Now, hands on the wall. Now, the cop is approaching, and the car's coming behind him, and they've got the blue lights going. We've got some powder in your pockets. I think you're going to 30th in California for the evening. And you cuff him and away he goes. The difference between the response that you or I would have coming out and the cop depends solely on the perception of efficacy. In one, we are the prey. 
In the other, we are the predator. He looks at this guy coming out, and he reaches down, and he realizes, I've got backup, I've got a weapon, I've got handcuffs, this guy's coming with me. I'm in control of this situation. I have efficacy. As opposed to a family coming out of the restaurant, oh my God, we're about to get mugged, let's go. The difference is the perception of control. Now keep that in mind. The difference is the perception of control. What do you think? It's a cognitive process. So the notion then is anxiety organizes our perceptions, memories, and actions. Next slide, please. We can talk about cognitive deficiencies, which is impulsive behavior in youngsters, but also cognitive distortions. When we're anxious, we're processing a lot of information. We're thinking about it, but we may not be thinking about it adaptively, accurately. We're, not, we're misperceiving the event. Next slide, please. Now, does a family influence anxiety in youngsters? And the answer is yes, although as you can see, it's a bit inconsistent. A better example of this would be a personal example. Parenting counts. It's worth noting, my mother-in-law, we call her Gamma, she's 90 plus years old, lovely woman, wonderful. She is the font of Southern wisdom, she is. She grew up in nor rural North Carolina, tobacco farm during the Great Depression. So, flash forward, and what's her line? I, I can't do a Southern accent. God willing and the creek don't rise. Now, th think about that for a minute. God willing, we pray to providence, and the creek don't rise. I hope that nature doesn't just flood us out. That's her way of coping with stress. God willing and the creek don't rise. I can't control it, so I'm waiting, I'm hoping bad things don't happen and I'll pray for help. That's it, that's her way of looking at the world. And in the realm of rural North Carolina and the Great Depression, that's what they had. Now, flash forward about 40 years, and our daughter, who is now five, six years old, She's on a razor in our driveway. You remember razors, those things where you stand like this and you go like that and you go, Ooh. We've got about a 100-foot driveway and she's going back and forth. And she goes, Dad, look at me, it's so fast. I'm like, that's great, Gracie. You just keep going, I'm going to make a turn. Look at me. I'm like, that's fabulous, Gracie. Gamma comes out. She's looking at this and she goes, that looks pretty dangerous to me. I said, really? She's, it's okay. No, you know, she really needs to have those elbow protectors and knee protectors. She needs a helmet, and she needs those wrist guards, because if she fell off, she could break her wrist. And I said, and, which is actually true, right? And I said, Gamma, you know, it's one inch off the ground. If she steps down, she's just fine. I said, I don't think there's much danger here. Hold that line. I don't think there's much danger here. She looks at me and she says, you're her father. Why would you accept any risk? And I was like, ooh. <laughs> Do you remember Twilight Zone with Rod Serling? Rod Serling is now standing behind me going, Mark Reinecke has just entered a dangerous and cold place. <laughs> Mark Reinecke has entered the realm of anxiety development. Mark Reinecke has entered the Twilight Zone. And I remember, and only a child psychologist could say this, could say this is I realized instantly how anxiety got transmitted from grandma to my wife and was now being transmitted to my daughter. Three generations of females in the Reinecke family, or in this case, the Engel family, a straight line of anxiety. I walked in and only a child psychologist would say this. I said, you know, honey, I'm talking to my wife now, the intergenerational transmission of anxiety ends here. <laughs> and Actually, would, would you do me a favor? If you would go in the back room in my briefcase, the black room, the, the black briefcase, in it is a day timer, a, 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 a calendar. Would you bring out my calendar, please? I gotta show you something. She'll get this and I'll show you the pictures. So the notion is family does matter. Parenting styles matter. Maternal over-involvement and intrusiveness and hovering matters. Dads limiting high-risk behavior or being impunitive and unpredictable and punitive, they matter. Parenting does matter. Next slide, please. So what do kids worry about? This comes from Tom Ollendeck. They worry about lots of things, from failure and criticism, they worry about unknown, ambiguous situations, they worry about getting hurt, they worry about small, fast-moving animals, uh, they worry about death and danger, medical fears, needles, they don't like it, doctor's offices, they don't like it, perfect, thank you. 
This one I've got to come down and show you. Actually, there's going to be a couple of things in here. So we've got one child. She's 24 years old. I call this the shrine. There's a couple of things here, the shrine. In my book. I carry her picture with me always. So here she is, and she's about 10 years old here. And you see my wife and her on the sand at the beach. And she's in a life preserver. And I want you to note something here. She is, she is smiling. Take a look. There she is. And we are in, there she is. You can see there's Gracie. She's smiling. Got it? Here she is. Do I got more in here? Oh, I've got more. Wait. What dad doesn't want to show up kid pictures? This is her taking her first steps here. It's really cute. And I'll tell you a story about that if you would like, her taking her first steps. But these, all these photos blend together in parenting. And what's worth noting, here she is. You can see it. Why am I showing you these pictures? Because we are in a Blackwater Swamp in South Carolina. We made it our vision, our mission. We were going to raise a courageous and brave daughter. And so part of that was modeling. So she would watch, you know who she loved? Mulan. She loved Mulan. Remember Mulan? Yes. Let's get down to business to defeat the Huns. And she'd go, Huns? Right. She was going to be Mulan. But here in this photo, we're in South Carolina in a blackwater swamp. Have any of you been to a blackwater swamp? No? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about then. It's 95 degrees, 100% humidity, and that water is so black with organic material that if you put your foot in up to here, you can't see your toes. And so we're out there canoeing. And I asked the guide, I said, you know, are there alligators here? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, are there water moccasins? Yeah. I'm like, I am pulling my foot. I'm not dragging my foot behind the boat. Now, what you'll notice is we are living bravely. And there's two things to note from those photos. One is, did you notice that my daughter is smiling? She is loving this. She is living courageously. We're going to go on a black water tour. Note the other thing. My wife is sitting on the shore. She wants no part of this. You, you go be courageous, but I am staying on the dirt where there are no water moccasins and alligators. Um, the notion then is just as parenting can contribute to anxiety, parenting can help to ameliorate anxiety. Parenting counts. Next slide. Some are developmentally appropriate. Separation anxiety in little kids. You expect to see it. You want to see it. Early childhood. Uh, noises, dark, doctors, animals, middle child, frightening, scary movie. Let's talk about something here. Disney. What are kids afraid of? A little kid. They're afraid of losing a parent. The entire Disney industry. Let's think. <clears throat> Nemo. What's he doing? Trying to get back to his mother. Cinderella. Mother's dead. Um, who else is there? Bam. Oh my God. Bambi. <laughs> Shooting Bambi's mother. That is a worst case scenario for a child. The entire Disney industry is built upon children's normative anxiety about separation from parents. What about teenagers? What are they afraid of? Well, a couple of things. One is they want to be independent from their parents. I don't need you. I've got this right. And we can talk about that a little bit if you would like. But they want to be independent. But they're also afraid of being independent. Sexuality. Think about every slasher movie we have seen. You know what happens in them. A group of teenagers is off at a place. Where are they? They're at a cabin. They're at a hostel. They're on a boat. And miraculously, there are no adults around. It's true, right? And then what happens? The movie is proceeding along. And about 20 minutes in, a girl will take her top off. It's true. So they introduce sexuality into the script. Kids start making out. And who shows up then? It's true. The, these films, and they're frightening. And then, of course, what happens is they all survive, or most of them survive. But is the threat still there? Yes, because there's always a sequel. <laughs> so, the, But the notion is, note how they, they pull away adult support, and then they introduce something that's frightening and novel to a teenager, and the anxiety builds and explodes. That industry is based upon normative teenager anxiety. Next slide, please. So here's what kids are afraid. I was the bottom guy. I was afraid of something under my bed. 
worth noting, our daughter, we used to live in Winnetka, Illinois, which is a rather leafy suburb, suburb north of Chicago. And you all know Winnetka? It's pretty affluent. It's kind of like, what's it kind of like? Palo Alto. And um, we're there, and my daughter, she's about six years old, and she goes, Dad, there's somebody in the tree outside my window. I'm really scared. I said, Gracie, there's nothing. Dad, I can see the, the branches moving. There's somebody in the tree. I said, Gracie, it's nothing. Dad, there's somebody in the tree. I said, Gracie, that's impossible. Why? I said, okay. If we lived in Chicago, there could be somewhere somebody in the tree. But here in Winneka, it's against the law, so there's nobody in the tree. She goes, oh, okay. Now, think about what we just did. It's the same stimulus, but we've got a parent making some sense of it and giving a reassuring comment to the daughter. And the anxiety just is gone. We are processing the anxiety-laden situation for our child. Next slide. This is the normative fear of teenagers. It says, we want you to have fun, as long as it's fun that enhances your college admission application. <laughs> Next slide. So what, what do we have in anxiety? Well, we've talked about this. Fearful anticipation, something bad is coming. We ruminate and dwell on it. We can't disengage from these thoughts as they flow through our head. We become vigilant and start scanning our world, looking for risk and danger. As there's a colleague who said, you know, there's, from an evolutionary perspective, there's no value in smelling the pretty flowers. There's none. We should be scanning the hillside looking for the saber-toothed tigers. We should. There's a value in being vigilant. There's no value from an evolutionary perspective. We are wired to worry. We are. There's autonomic arousal, and then we want to get away from the mugger coming out of the, hall, out of the, out of the alley of life. We want to avoid and evade. Next slide. Now, what I would say is, the, this, this is what I tell my grad students, the solution is embedded in the problem. For the fearful anticipation, we want to maintain a sense of perspective. Let's not magnify and catastrophize. What's the actual risk? How bad is it going to be? We want to stop ruminating, and this takes two forms, either mindful acceptance, well, that's an interesting thought, or solution-focused thinking, and what are you going to do about it? For the vigilance, we want to attend not just to the risk, but to the safety cues. How do we know we're going to be okay? I'll tell you how I know I'm going to be okay coming out of Clark Street because there's a cop standing right there and there's a camera from the restaurant right above my head. Nobody is going to touch me while I'm standing here. I know I'm going to be safe. I'm attending to the safety cues, not just the risk. Autonomic arousal, relaxation. We talked about, we mentioned controlled breathing, those sorts of things. We can talk about that if you like. And then avoidance. What I tell my students, what I tell my patients, that which we fear is what we should do. Let me repeat that. That which we fear is what we should do. If you're afraid of it, you need to do it. I was telling this to a little 10-year-old girl who was anxious, and she goes, so you're going to tell me to run into the burning building? And I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. We, that's exactly what we're going to do. That which we fear is what we, were gonna, what we will do. Approach and master. Okay, next slide. So. Anxious children, when they get anxious, they experience this more intensely. They have what they call lack of um, affect regulation. They, that self-soothing ability, the ability to chill yourself out, has not developed. They feel like they're unable to manage the situation. They have a low perception of efficacy. I can't control this. I'm, I'm at risk. They, show, they ex express this to others. And in fact, other people do notice that the kid is nervous. The parents do. The peers do. Teachers do. They don't keep it in. Other people will notice that they are vibrating and anxious and worried. And they tend to be viewed by others as labile, inflexible, kind of negative, kind of, what's the word I want? Neurotic, for lack of a better term. It's picked up by their world. And their world, not surprisingly, responds accordingly. It's true. Next slide. Is it common? Yes. You know, we've talked about the one in five. That's true. Um, it's tr Five to 18 percent of all children and adolescents have a diagnosable anxiety disorder. Not just a little bit of worrying, but a diagnosable one. This is not good. And it's worth noting, 80 percent of adults who have an anxiety disorder, their first symptoms were experienced during their childhood or adolescence. Other than things like, I was in a car crash and I got a phobia, or actually, I do have a phobia, and if you want, I can tell you about it. 
um, I've got an eyeball phobia. I know exactly where I got it. I got it freshman year in college. But should I tell you about my eyeball phobia? Okay. You got it. Okay. So here I am. I'm a freshman in college. Professor Mark, yes. Do you ever think of going to medical school? I'm like, sure. Why not? Do you ever think of being a neuro ophthalmologist? Sure. Why not? Come on down to the hospital, and I'll show you some neuro ophthalmology. So I go down. I want to see neuro ophthalmology. I'm a freshman. I'm 18 years old. This is in the mid 1970s. So back then, it was a darkened operating room with a big microscope. Now they would have cameras and TV screens all over, but back then it was a microscope. So I go in, and it's a darkened room, and the patient is all draped out, and I'm wearing scrubs and everything. And he goes, here, step on in, Mark. So I step in, and he wings the, rotates the microscope in front of me, and I look in, and there is an eyeball this big with a scalpel coming out of it. And I was like, oh, God. No neuro-ophthalmology for me. So I have got, I've got a conditioned aversion to eyeballs. So think about this. LASIK surgery, somebody putting a laser beam in my eye, not happening. Contact lenses, not happening. So now I wear glasses. If one of you was to start adjusting your contact lens, I would just look away and look at this side of the room. Um, but then it generalized out, because these things generalize, to Visine commercials on TV. If there's a Visine commercial, oh, look at how fresh my eyes are. I look over at the other side of the room. I'm going to go to the refrigerator and get a drink. I can't take Visine. What was that movie in the 1970s, 1980s? Clockwork Orange. Oh, not happening. Not happening. So, but the notion is I have an anxiety. I know where it came from, and it's generalizing out, right? My wife looks at me, and she goes, I don't get it. You can't put Visine in your eyes? No. And she goes, I don't get it. What do you mean? You can go for a swim in a pool. I can. I can swim in a pool with my eyes open. I can swim in the ocean with my eyes open. It doesn't trouble me. She goes, why don't you just tell yourself you're taking a swim in the pool? I'm like, OK. Now, I want you to watch this. It's a swim in the pool. I can put my finger on my eyeball. I can feel my amygdala, the limbic system, lighting up as this object comes in towards my eye. But by telling myself it's just a swim, no, granted, I have practiced this. And that's important with anxiety is to practice. I can tell myself it's just a swim in the pool. It's no big deal. And I can literally put my finger on my eyeball. I can feel the anxiety building, but I am cognitively overriding. If we had, I'm going to draw now. Wait a minute. If we have a brain here. Ooh, I wish I had colors. It's all black. OK. Here's your brain, brain stem. Here's your limbic system, amygdala down in here. Signal comes in. This is that, marriage we talked about the worm, old part of the brain. Signal comes in, sends a, oh my god, there's danger, danger, danger. Sends a signal to the front, low, front, um, front of the brain. You better run across the street. You better wash your hands, get those germs off. You better do whatever you have to do. Sends a signal back to the motor strip here. Wash hands, wash hands, wash hands. Sends a signal back to the front. You're washing your hands. It's looking good there, Mark. And then there is a GABAergic fiber, and this is where I wish I had a different color, that is inhibitory. It's GABA. That goes back to the, back to the, um, where did I put the, oh, here's the cap. Back to the amygdala and sends the signal, and this is through the left and right cingulate and then down to the lower areas of the brain. Ah, oh, this is great. Lovely. So there's inhibitory fiber here that sends the signal Mission accomplished, you can relax now. In anxiety disorders, this system doesn't work. And what you get is this whole brain activation that on an fMRI, and I, I don't know if I took it in or left it out, you see it, your brain looks like that. It's the signal is just not getting through that the anxiety has been taken care of. You don't have to worry. And your brain just lights up. Now, if you think about what's happening when we treat it, if you give an anxiety medication, an anxiolytic, Xanax, Boost Bar, uh, what they do is they hit it here. They reduce the in initial signal of anxiety. 
cognitive therapy, what I do when I tell myself it's just a swim in the pool, I am cognitively overriding from the frontal lobe. So this is top down and the medications are bottom up. It makes sense then. Now it's interesting because they did a study on this. It was Baxter and Schwartz, 1995, Archives of General Psychiatry. Actually, this is something that you get when you're a college professor. I can forget where I parked my car, but I can give you citations from 1947. Um, I, it's true. Um, <coughs> Baxter and Schwartz, 1995, Archives of General Psychiatry. They published a study using PET scans. So they're looking at glucose metabolism in the brain. And what they note is that medications stabilize the uh, activation of the brain in anxious patients, in OCD patients in that study. Everybody, yes, of course they do. Medications, of course, work to stabilize metabolism in the brain. And you can see this activation because the brain is burning up glucose as it's firing like this. The interesting thing was they had a CBT group, a, a psychotherapy group, an exposure group, and that also normalized the metabolism in the brain. And you couldn't believe the letters to the editor. Wait a minute, how does talking to somebody change brain metabolism? Oh my God, this was earth shaking. I gave a lecture on it. I said Rene Descartes was wrong. Rene Descartes was the philosopher who, the French philosopher who gave us mind body dualism. No, oh, there it is. You can see, there it is on the right. That's the Baxter and Schwartz, the basal ganglia and the right cingulate. It turns out there are two ways to sort of chill the brain bottom up with meds, top down with exposure and psychotherapy, talking our way through it. Next slide, please. So there's classical conditioning. That's where I got my eye phobia. There's operant conditioning where we're rewarded by avoiding. I go to the other side of the street and I feel so much better. Almost immediately I escape the mugger and we'll feel better. The problem is we've also reinforced two things, the perception of danger we now really believe that it's dangerous to be on Clark Street at one in the morning, and the perception that I can't cope. I can't handle that. I'm not going back there. I'm, I'm, I can't do it, man. So a while, that, while there's an immediate reduction in anxiety, the lesson we are learning is not a good one. Avoidance leads to consolidation of the belief that I can't handle it. Finally, there's vicarious learning, and that is what, what did Hemingway say? You don't have to die to write a death scene. It's true. We don't have to be eaten by a tiger to realize that we should not get into the cage at the zoo. We don't. We can kind of know from seeing what tigers do. We can learn vicariously. Now, I put this up then because all three of these, classical conditioning and desensitization, operant conditioning, rewarding approach and mastery, and then modeling, what I tell ki kids in our clinic is I will not ask you to do anything that I won't do. I'll do it first. You want to do one? You want to do a, okay, I want you to do just what I do. If you come in and you've got a fear of germs, you can do it. I want you to cross your leg for me. This is true. I would actually do this. Actually, do you have a fear of germs? Oh, good, because this is going to make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> what I want you to take your hand. Actually, come on. Okay, first we're going to, bottom of your shoe, rub it. Hands together. Okay, now come here. Okay, so we've now got each other's germs, right? <laughs> okay, now, thank you. You've been great. She's been, what a great audience. Okay. Now, note something. You're all going, ooh, God, ooh, ah. Here's my question. No, 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 no. That which we fear is what we should do. Okay, put your foot over. <laughs> do it. Oh, we'll talk hand sanitizer. How refreshing. Good. Okay. Here is my, here is my, I want you to note something here. Here's my question. You're all going, ooh, ooh, uh, ooh. Uh, does she have one germ on her that she didn't have before? The answer is no. There's billions of germs all around. No, no, no. We are going to throw this out. I tell you, I am, I am anti-hand sanitizer. I'm anti for a reason. Because when you use hand sanitizer too much, what do you get? Super germs. We are breeding germs that are going to wipe us out. 
the best thing you can do, and you're hearing it from Centers for Disease Control, is soap and water. Soap and water. Yep, yep, it's true. They are correct. They are smarter than me. Um, hand sanitizer, I guess in the, in the land of COVID, we should all do it. But for somebody who's got anxiety about germs, I throw it all away. Don't do it. And what I tell them is you can, of course, take a bath, take a shower, wash your hands. Certainly when you, before you eat and after you go to the bathroom, wash your hands. But then you've got to germ up. Afterwards, you've got to germ up and go through your day. Because what we're doing is becoming accustomed to the fact that these germs are not dangerous. We are no more at risk now than we were five minutes ago. And that's hard to rationally accept, but it's true. Next slide. So what we have, and this is something I, I, I like this because it's got a formula. It's got an actual function sign. So that means it's science. Um, to get anxious, and this is any anxiety, from a fear of germs to a fear of the IRS to a fear of COVID to a fear of anything. Fear of tall buildings, doesn't matter. Fear of airplanes, doesn't matter. Fear of social rejection, people won't like me. They all involve a perception of an impending threat, something bad is coming, and a perception that I can't cope with it. That's it. If we change these two variables, the anxiety goes away. It's, the first side is it's not a big threat, it's not a big deal. And the second side is I can handle it, I've got this. As we change those two beliefs, the anxiety any anxiety dissipates. Next slide. So how do we do this? Well, we develop fear hierarchies. We do, this is the toolbox. Teach controlled breathing and relaxation. We model it, just like I did. I wouldn't have touched this if I thought it was dangerous, and so neither should you. We model it, systematic des desensitization, exposure, rewarding. That is fabulous the way you guys did this. You guys are aces. You know, we, we reward, and as a parent, you think that kids don't listen to when you reward them? And it doesn't have to be chips and money and stuff like that. Just, you know something, you, you are brave. Kids hear that and internalize it. And then self-management, we teach them to do it themselves, to practice it on their own. I love that with that girl. That which I fear is what I should do. She, the mother comes in the next week and she goes, what have you done to my daughter? She wants to go and take on everything. She came in with a baseball cap that said no fear across the top. I created an anxiety conquering monster and her mother was amazed and it took two sessions. It was not hard. I know, it's not hard. When it clicks, it really clicks. Next slide. Here's the cognitive things. We do mood monitoring, and fear thermometers, problem solving to also reduce a generalized perception of vulnerability, of threat in the world, that I'm living in a dangerous world. That's where that fear of fires and mudslides and drought, I can't, we can't make, we can't tell our children and have them learn that the world is a safe place because it's not. I remember one time I was working with a anxious patient in Chicago. I said, do you know, as a, uh, an adult, I said, do you know what the mortality rate in Chicago is? She goes, no, it's 100%. That's not funny. <laughs> it's true. The mortality rate, as best we can tell, the mortality rate continues to be 100%. Um, so I, we can't, we want reassurance. We want to know that we're going to be safe, except we're not. And my phrase on this is nobody gets away free. Nobody gets through life without fear, anxiety, trauma. It's a part of the human condition. Nobody gets away free. There's a, there's a, um, actually, well, yes. So you're saying that it's a the question. That's the question of the day, isn't it? And so there we're asking, the, so the question is, what do I do if I know there's risk, which there always is, but I'm having trouble ascertaining the level of the risk. That's where, how would you put it? You want to ask yourself, what, what evidence do I have on this? You know, what is the evidence? What is leading me to feel this way? Is it something I know about this neighborhood or this event in life? Or is this coming from my past experience where basically I am a risk averse person? And there are individuals who are risk averse. And this, I call them Jerry's kids. I refer, I'm referring to Jerome Kagan, who was a professor at Harvard. And he has studied, if you look, there we go. It's a normal distribution. And this would be behavioral inhibition. So these are highly inhibited youngsters, and these are highly disinhibited youngsters. And it turns out, so these youngsters, 
how it's mother's shadow. They're always clinging to their mother's leg. They're always, you can see this in toddlers. They're temperamentally anxious, nervous, risk averse. This, these are the kids who run in where the devil fears to tread. They will jump on that jungle gym. They will run out into the street. To, they don't, they'll play with that dog even if it is a Doberman pincher. They are disinhibited. It turns out that for 90% of these youngsters, the level of inhibition seems to be regulated by or, in, or by the environment, environmental exposure and how much confidence the child learns growing up. For this bottom 10%, right down in here, these ultra inhibited kids, that, and it goes back to early childhood, to infancy and toddlerhood, for this group of kids, there seems to be a biological press, and it projects forward up through adolescence and adulthood. Uh-oh, I'm getting a sign. What's it say? Oh, I gotta hurry. Next slide, let's get out of here. Okay, so here, this is coming to mindfulness. How do you tolerate when you don't know? By letting it go, it all gets done, but when we try and try, the world is beyond living. Winning. Next slide. Here's our life. And if you've been whitewater rafting, you know what I'm talking about. Life is like a river trip. And the first thing they teach you, if you've ever been whitewater rafting, lesson number one is you're gonna get thrown from the boat. And what should you do when you get thrown from the boat? Does anybody know? No, relax and, no, you don't pick your feet up. Where do you put your feet? Forward, downstream, cover your head, feet downstream, be a stick. Next slide. This is life. Be like a stick. Let the current of life take you through. If you swim against the tide, you're going to hit the rocks and you're going to be hurt. Let the current take you through the rapids. Just like a stick, it will drop you in a little eddy where you see the styrofoam cups floating. And then you'll see your boat a mile downstream, and then I guess I gotta go get it. Be a stick, float with the current of life. Next slide. So what's a good treatment? Well, psychoeducation, let's explain what anxiety is and where it comes from. Teach relaxation, reinforce adaptive behavior and approaching, we model it, we teach problem solving, and we do a lot of exposure. Next slide. This is fear, this comes from Phil Kendall. I sometimes have kids put this on their desk at school, tape it on. Are you feeling frightened? We want to monitor our moods. Actually, just labeling your mood. You know, I'm starting to get anxious. I'm starting to get worried. That is half, you're half the way home when you just label and can reflect upon your own emotions. So we teach kids to do that. Or am I expecting bad things? What are the thoughts that are going through my head? Oh my God, this is going to be terrible because what? I won't get into med school. I won't get into grad school. My parents will be upset. Oh my God. Oh, what will my friends think? Yeah, what will they think? Let's look at the cognitions. Attitudes, how are you coping with it? What are you doing? And then finally, you want to reinforce adaptive behavior. You actually handled that test. You actually did uh, walk down the street. You did walk into the burning building. You, you, you did put your hand on the bottom of your shoe. Let's do that again. Let's do it 100 times. It do it until you don't care. And then the anxiety is mastered. Next slide. So this is the Coping Cat book. Uh, that Phil Kendall developed, and it works. This is a script for managing anxiety in children. And if you, if you Google coping cat, you'll find it. I think you can't go to psychology at Temple without doing a study on this. Everybody's part of it. Next slide. Perfectionism, ah, oh, what a bugaboo. How many kids think an A minus is the same as an F? If I don't get into fill in the blank university, it's gonna be horrible. One time I was giving a talk in Chicago, and I said it was a group of parents and I said, you know, it's been proven, but ne it's been hypothesized, but never proven that you can be happy and successful in life without going to Princeton. And ha I, you, I, you can't make this up. Half the people in the room got, got up and started clapping, and the other half were horrified. Because the other half were, my son has to get into Cal. My daughter has to get into Yale. You know, they were, this perfectionism was just driving them crazy. Next slide. So, let's look at this. This is Martha Stewart's take. I'm a maniacal perfectionist, and if I weren't, I wouldn't have this company. It's the best rap. Nobody's gonna fault me for that. I've proven that being a perfectionist can be profitable and admirable when creating content across the board, in television, books, newspapers, radio, videos, all the content is impeccable. And my question is, do we wanna raise our children to be like Martha Stewart? I would suggest not. <laughs> Next slide. 
We do not want to perfect ourselves to death. That Lexus commercial, the relentless suit of perfectionism. God, I want to take it. I want to change the channel. Perfectionism is a fool's errand. Next slide. This is one of those, God, I wish I'd written this. And let's ponder this word by word. This comes to us from Anna Quinlan. Trying to be perfect may be sort of inevitable for people like us, for you and for me and for our kids. We, want, we are smart and ambitious and interested in the world and in its good opinion. We want other people to think well of us. We do. At one level, it's too hard, but at another, it's too cheap and easy. It requires you mainly to read the zeitgeist of whenever and wherever you happen to be and be the best at whatever the zeitgeist dictates or requires. And when you're clever, you can read them and do the imitation required. And here's the line that I really love. Hold this to your heart. Share this with your kids. But nothing important or meaningful or beautiful or interesting or great ever came out of imitation. The thing that is really hard and really amazing is giving up on being perfect and beginning the work of becoming yourself. We were talking about this out in the, in the front there, and I was sharing with folks how I was admitted to Stanford as a graduate student in biochemistry, and that lasted one day. One day. And I went into the dean and changed every course on my curriculum. 14, 12, 14 biochemistry courses, gone. You can't do that. Why not? Because we admitted you in biochemistry. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's for me. I want to study neuroscience. So the question, and I did, I shifted over into neurobiology and studied crayfish. I love crayfish. I loved that work. I am a neuroscientist at heart now. So the question is, did I fail? Well, I don't know. It depends on how you look at it. I clearly was not a success as a biochemist. I never took another biochemistry class for the rest of my life. But I loved and benefited from neuroscience. Sometimes what is perceived as a failure is just a shift in the a, a, a course correction on the drive through life. It all depends on how we look at it. Next slide, please. So these notions that what I would say is perf perfect doesn't exist conceptually or in practice. And it is worth noting, level of perfectionism in youngsters, we've done studies on this, is associated with level of depression and anxiety. Being perfect is a fool's errand. It's a two-edged sword. It builds beautiful buildings and fast cars, but it comes at a terrible cost, which is when we don't meet that very, very high standard, that unattainable standard, we feel demoralized and depressed and anxious. Let it go. Next slide. Oh, wait, wait no, don't, let, don't change it. This is the Reinecke comment at the bottom. This is Mark's statement. In a changing world, flexibility and creativity are more valuable than the relentless pursuit of perfection. And this is a shot off of Lexus's bow. Flexibility and creativity are more valuable than perfection. There's lots of smart people who don't succeed because they don't have tenacity and flexibility. Okay, next slide. Intrusive thoughts, all this stuff swirling around your head. I refer to these as the flying monkeys. And we all remember this, the monkeys from the Wizard of Oz. They scared the bejesus out of me. They were as bad as the Oompa Loompas. They, but remember, if you think about it, two things about this. Remember the monkeys. They actually don't do anything. They don't kill anybody. And at the end, when she throws the water on the witch, the monkeys go, hail Dorothy. It turns out the monkeys are OK. And when you look at them a little more closely, he's actually cute. Some, he's got blue face. Somewhere there was some, a woman, I presume it was a woman, in, uh, what would it be, makeup, putting lipstick on him. A cute little outfit, and there's Toto. When you look at them up close, they're actually not dangerous at all. And so too with all of these thoughts that flow through our head that, that vex us and worry us. They're just thoughts. And my view is, you can't stop them, so let them fly. Let them rip. Go for it. Next slide. Oh, this is a seven plus or minus two. Worrying, we have, it turns out our RAM, the amount of information we can hold in short-term memory is relatively small. We can hold seven plus or minus two bits of information, which is why phone numbers are seven bits long. But if I'm working on an exam and I have this thought, oh my God, I don't have this question. Okay, that's one. You know, I may not get into medical school, too. My 
parents are going to be so upset. My friends are going to be upset. That's four. I'm now down from seven, six, five, four, three. Three plus and minus two bits of information. I'm basically clogging up my short-term memory and attention with, for lack of a better term, pop-ups with flying monkeys. And they all may be true. My parents may be upset. I may not know the answer to this question. I may not get into medical school. All true, but irrelevant. So what we should want to do then is eliminate these unproductive secondary cognitions. And then you'll have your seven bits of information, your RAM, to put against the problem in front of you. Clear out the clutter. And you say, Mark, this sounds like mindfulness, like you know, clearing uh, mindful reflection, like Buddhism. And I would say, you're absolutely correct. This is where science and, how would you put it, religion and spirituality come together. They take us to the same place. Next slide. Stephen, talk about a guy with crazy thoughts. Dogs that are rabid, uh, Jack Nicholson going choo, 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 to cars. Remember, it was the car that, that drives over you, Carrie, to two, 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 two buckets of blood. He has creepy thoughts. But he has these things flowing through his mind, and instead of going, oh, my God, I've got to stop thinking this is just craziness, he thinks, you know something, buckets of blood, that is, now there is an idea. I'll write a screenplay. He takes these crazy thoughts, and it turns out, it turns, there's been studies on this. Everybody in this room has crazy thoughts. We all do. 95% of people have crazy thoughts. You've had them, I've had them. The feeling that I have to stop them because they are bad, that secondary cognition is the problem. Just let them float. Let that flying monkey fly, and it will go away. Next slide. Does it work? Does treatment work? Yes. What's worth noting is down on the bottom. I'm just going to fly through this. I present this because this is 1994. This is the first study completed of treatment of, of anxiety in children. 60% versus 10% were diagnosis-free at one, at one year follow-up. Now, what that tells us is that 10%, there's not much of a spontaneous relapse rate in anxiety in children. If a kid is anxious, they're going to, 90% of the time, they're going to stay anxious. So just saying, it's going to pass, they'll grow out of it, not so much. But the treatment works. Next slide. This is the follow-up, 71 versus 7. The follow-up study, it's now replicated. The studies, these treatments work. Next slide. Uh, we're coming to the end. Let's go to Buddhism. This is Shantideva. He was a Buddhist monk in the 8th century. And we can talk about Shantideva if you want. He says, he wrote a book called the Bodhisattva. And he says, for long as space remains and as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the suffering of others. That's our purpose in life. As parents, as our fellow man sitting next to somebody on your left and your right, we are here to dispel the suffering of others. I wish I'd written this. If you can solve your problem, then what need is there of worrying? And if you cannot solve it, then what need is there of worrying? What need is there to say any more? You either change it or you accept it, as the wise man said. Next slide. Now, this, let's go back to 8th century India. In 8th century India, you were probably living in a little village, and there were the worst thing that could happen. You had a little garden, you grew some vegetables, maybe you had a goat or some chickens. The worst thing that could happen to you is a herd of elephants comes through your yard. And they would trample your village, they would ruin your house, they would ru you ruin your garden so you've got no food, and they kill people. They would run over you. Not good. Rampaging elephants are not good. But here we have... Mindfulness, the Buddhist monk with the elephant. Let's see what Shantideva has to say. Next slide. Wandering it where it will, the elephant of the mind will bring us down in a torrent of unrelenting pains of deepest hell. No worldly beast, however wild or crazed, could bring upon us such calamity. If with mindfulness's rope, the elephant of the mind is tethered all around, all our fears will come to nothing and every virtue will drop into our hands. Next slide. If, by simple binding of the mind alone, all these things are likewise bound, by simple taming of the mind alone, all these things are likewise tamed. And here's the line I wish I'd wrote. For all anxiety and fear, all suffering in its boundless measure, 
Their source and wellspring is the mind itself. Thus the truthful one has said. It's all in how we look at it, that perception of threat, that perception of efficacy. And if we can change those things, it goes away. Next slide. So does it work? The answer is yes. That's a D score. That is a very significant D score of a comparison between the active treatment and the control group. 0.94. It's huge. Next slide. This is Reynolds, um, 0.84 to minus 0.48. Next slide. So it does work. This is with 48 studies. This is six, six decades of research, 0.95. This is in 2019. CBT is effective for preventing and treating childhood anxiety across a range of ages and formats. This focus on how we think works. Next slide. So summary, it works. Anxiety works for you. It's adaptive. It's evolved for millennia, for millions of years to help us to survive. As we're approaching life's dangers and threats and vagaries and troubles, we want to think clearly and keep our anxieties and our fears in perspective. As you note, as best we can given the information we have. We want to approach the things we fear and expose ourselves to them, master them. Active problem solving and solution focused thinking are balanced by mindful acceptance. We want to take the large view, the longer view, not just thinking about the virus of the day or the problem with my exam, because in five years you're not going to care about this exam. You're not. Nobody will ever, nobody will care after you get, have a career what your high school GPA was. Who knew? You will even forget it, what your high school GPA was. And this allows us then, you can see this is where it gets really broad. It allows you to, to live with faith and hope and equanimity in a world that does have risk. It allows you to keep calm and carry on. Next slide. That is the little book. If you want, I can tell you about the little book. Um, you can get it on Amazon for like $4. Uh, it's called Little Ways to Keep Calm and Carry On. You want the backstory on it? Yeah, no. Yeah. Who wants the backstory? Yeah. Okay. So this goes back to 19, no, 2008, the market crash. I was the head of a department at Northwestern. I get called into my boss's office and he goes, you know, in academia, a lot of the funding in a university is f off of the endowment. But you may not know this, and when you make a donation to a university, they can live off of the income that's generated by your donation, but they don't actually spend the donation. They have an endowment, and some universities have billions of dollars of endowment, and they live off of the float. When the market goes down, bad things will happen because they're forbidden by law from selling the principal. So there's no income. So I get called into my boss's office and he goes, you know, it's looking bad right now. We're gonna need a 30% reduction in salaries and expenses, 30%. I was like, oh my word, oh. When do you need this? Thinking, give me a six weeks, I gotta make a budget. And he goes, this afternoon. <gasps> 30%, think about what you would do, 30%. So we saved the people who were most at risk, the secretaries, the people who had low salaries, we didn't touch them. The full professors, the people with rich labs, were all tightening our belts. And we did it. We cut 30% from the budget. So I go home that night. I'm getting off the train. I'm driving home, going home. My wife picks me up. How was your day, honey? It was a good day, except for, yeah, I got to tell you. Our department, we had a 30% salary reduction. And I said, really? She, yeah, I took a 30% salary cut. Oh, my God. How are we going to pay our mortgage? How are we going to... Um, put our kid through college. How are we going to pay our expenses? Oh, we got credit card bill. 30%. Yeah, 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 yeah. Remember, this is grandma. Remember, this is what she picked up. The creek is now rising. <laughs> you know? Um, and she goes, I said, it's going to be fine. It's going to be, it's going to be good. We're going to get through. Why aren't you worried? Because it's going to be, uh, honey, why aren't you? You know something? Relax. It's going to be fine. So I go, she goes, but why aren't you worrying? So I go home and I opened up my laptop. And in it, I've got 20 PowerPoint slides that I used for second year medical students, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy for anxiety, so that they can help their anxious patients. And my wife is floating through them, 20 slides. And she goes, everything my mother taught me was wrong. You know, plan for the worst and hope for the best, out. And what I say is plan for the most likely scenario, not the worst case scenario. There's no 
the, the most likely scenario is the one we should be looking for, because the, the worst case scenario is a 767 is going to fly through this building and kill us all. Why are we not worried about it? Because it's not likely. So don't worry about it. It's true. Um, so she goes, everything is wrong. And she looks at me and she goes, you know, these 20 slides would make a great book. And I said, I don't do popular books. I said, I don't go Oprah. Which, you know, if you're an academic, a real academic, you don't do popular because, you know, your colleagues will all look down on you like you've really lost it. And I was like, I don't do popular. And she goes, you just did a th took a 30% salary cut. You do now. <laughs> <laughs> so this book actually was really quick because the 20 PowerPoint slides became the 20 chapters. I mean, I wrote it in like two weeks. Now, it took a little while longer to come out to get published, but it was actually kind of a snap. Everything in it then, you can get it, see what you think. Everything in it is based on science and is you know, clinically useful. And you'll see it's got a little cheeky story. Uh, also, in a world where everybody writes 300 page books that nobody reads, this one, 130 pages. You literally can read it in a night. It's an easy little book that you can keep in your pocket. But I'm not trying to sell books. All I'm trying to say is even, even the book this lecture comes out of an anxiety-laden situation where I got hit with a 30% salary cut. Now, I will tell you, you want another story and then we'll call it a day? Sure. Okay, I want to give you a mindfulness story. And this is a true story. This goes back to, it's gotta be 35 years ago, 40 years ago. If you've been to Indiana, I was driving from Chicago to Indianapolis down I-65, straight as an arrow, it's through the cornfields of Indiana. This is in the winter, it was January. A storm had come through the night before, which is important. So if you've ever been in, through a Midwestern storm, it is, the plows had been through, so the road is clear, and the temperature dropped to about 10, 20 degrees. It was cold out, but you know when it gets that cold, the sky is just beautiful. There's no moisture in the atmosphere. The sky is this beautiful bright blue. There's this wisping snow going across the, the interstate. And I'm flying down it at 70, 75 miles an hour. What a beautiful, glorious winter day. Got the picture? Yeah. Okay. Now, you know when you come to a bridge and it says, caution, bridge surface may freeze before a roadway. Right. Do you pay attention? I didn't. I go up onto the overpass where there was a freeway overpass at 70, 75 miles an hour, and I hit the black ice. Boom! I am doing donuts down the middle of an interstate at 70 miles an hour. Now, the next part of this happens in two seconds. So I look to my left, and there's a set of big cement pillars holding up the freeway overpass. And I realize if the car goes to the left, I'm going to hit the cement and I'm gonna die. I'm gonna crash into the cement post and die. I look to my right, and the interstate rolls down a hill, and about 75 feet down at the bottom of a hill is a stand of pine trees. I can still picture them in my mind. I look to the right, and I realize if I go to the right, my car's gonna roll down the hill, hit the trees, and explode. I'm gonna die. So it literally was, look to the left, look to the right, Mark, you're about to die. Now. The thought that I had, remember, you can't, what they always teach you is you can't steer your way out of this. You're on ice, your car's out of control. So I took my foot off the accelerator. You don't hit the brake. I took my foot off the accelerator, and I took my hands off the wheel. And I remember the thought that shot through my head was, well, there you have it. There was no scream. There was no heart pounding. There was no visions of my life passing in front of me. It was like, you're going to die. There you go. You know, this is, I didn't say it, it was there you have it. It was not game, set, and match, but that's kind of the notion. You're about to die. Okay, that was it. I was calm, completely calm. Car goes swerving to the left and goes, the only place where the car, now you can say, Mark, this is divine providence. I don't know. Remember, it had snowed the night before. So where did the snow plows push the snow? Between the, two, the cement, the only place they could push it, between the cement pillars. My car goes screaming between two of the cement pillars and comes softly to rest in a snowbank. And not a scratch on the car, not a scratch on me. And I get out of the car and I'm looking around and I go, well, there you have it. <laughs> 
And then a guy comes up, and he's in a tow truck, and he's a big guy, he's got a tow truck, and he goes, did you call for a tow? And I'm like, no. I mean, I didn't even have a cell phone. And he goes, no, and he goes, well, 20 bucks and I'll pull you out. So I flipped him a 20, he pulls me out, and I go on my way. Now, what's the point of this? One is thank God, but the second is, even in, actually there's another philosopher I would like to drop on you, which is Epictetus, who wrote a book called The Enchiridion. And in the first century he wrote, Death is nothing awful or else Socrates would have thought it so. No, the only thing that is, is awful is our perception. Think about that. Death is nothing awful or else Socrates would have thought it so. Socrates drank the hemlock. I can die now or I can die without my honor and my beliefs five years from now. You know, I think I'll take the hemlock. It's the perception that death is awful. As soon as the, well, there you have it, went through my mind and I was acceptant of death, all of the anxiety just went to zero. Now, here's the phrase I would use. Once you can take death off the table, everything else is small potatoes. Once you're no longer really afeard for, uh, afraid for mortality, which is, I must admit, a tricky thing, once you can let that stream of elephants that are rushing through your mind go, all of the anxiety just vanishes. It's true. So mindfulness and then active reflection, having it maintaining a sense of perspective, these two things alleviate anxiety and help us to have equanimity. Next slide. So that's a thank you. There's my number. You, child mind. Also, there is a sign-up sheet up front. If you sign it, we can, I can get you copies of these slides. And we can send you newsletters and stuff like that. It's actually pretty useful. And next one. That's it. Done. Okay.